So um, first of all, I uh, just introduce myself and Dylan who also works in this project. Uh, my name is Stuart Lynn. I recognize a few places in the crowd. So some people know me, a lot of you won't. Um, I'm a, a researcher, a data scientist and an engineer. Um, and I currently work at the University of Chicago, which is a bit weird being in the New York Open Data Week, but that's where I work now. I work remotely from New York, lived here for about four or five years. I've been involved in a bunch of different projects. Dylan, who also works in this project, just a uh, shout out to him. He's been doing a lot of great work on this as well. Um, the part of the University of Chicago I work at is the Spatial Data Science, the Center for Spatial Data Science, which is a part of the organization that does a lot of things with mapping, a lot of things with spatial data, a lot of things with spatial statistics, um, and applies those to things like um, spatial epidemiology, so how viruses spread, which is obviously pretty relevant today, and things like uh, social determinants of health. So kind of like what factors about your community, what factors about where you live, um, your access to um, healthcare, medicine, how that affects your outcomes for health and things like that as well. So these are all spatial questions that are all really, really interesting. And what I'm here to talk about today is a tool that we're building, or a suite of tools that we're building, that should make building spatial applications and spatial dashboards, but any kind of dashboards, really kind of a lot easier. Um, so currently, you know, it can be a little bit tricky to do, but we're trying to build something that's going to be like universal, like hopefully no code at all. You can write no code, just like interact with the thing and get something really cool and amazing out of the end. We've been building this for about three months, um, so we're still fairly early on in the process, um, but we wanted to put it in front of everybody here today to kind of show you where we are, get you playing around with it, and kind of hear your feedback as to what we can be doing better with it, what kind of use cases we should be supporting, and what kind of things that you guys feel that you need to do in your day jobs that we currently don't have a tool for. So that's kind of where we are. So really kind of when we think about a geospatial dashboard or a geospatial application, we can ask like, what, what makes that up and what makes a good one? And I've built a crap ton of geospatial dashboards over the years. And I'm sure people in this room have them as well. Um, there's a lot of different parts of the process, but if it goes well, you end up with something like this. This is a, a project I worked on um, sort of the start of, uh, just before the pandemic hit um, with Hester Street, which is an organization based in Chinatown, um, who were looking to do a lot of um, interesting things with the, so, so they were involved in organizing the census um, effort to get people to sign up for the census, uh, fill out the census online, basically. Um, this is really important for representation, it's really important for funding. Um, and New York had some areas in it, like um, West Eye and Bushwick, where the numbers from the previous census were actually quite low. Um, and so they were doing a huge effort to try and get people to fill this out online. So we helped them build this dashboard that would suck in the data from the census API, which showed you how many people, what fraction of people was set up in any given area and filled out the census. Brought in data um, about the communities that were there and brought in data about local organizations that were there to get the, the people like filling out the census. And so this was a huge dashboard to help coordinate people on the ground, people doing the sort of organization of resources and literature and all that good stuff. And it was great. Um, I did it mostly as a volunteer with the organization um, and we built it really fast and we built it with like a set of tools and it worked really, really well until anything needed to be changed. Um, so if they needed to change like a title, or the color of a point or an icon that was being used, they would have to call me up and I would have to like go through a process of changing it and then pushing it live. And that was a huge roadblock. That was a huge impediment to them doing the work that they needed to do. It was a huge impediment to me doing the things that I'm better suited at doing, which is kind of like the more complicated things. And it just was a bit of a pain to, to put together. Um, and so that's one of the things we tend to find when we build custom dashboards like this is that it ends up really relying on an engineer or a data scientist like myself to kind of keep it up to date and keep it running which is obviously a bit of a problem. Another really good example of a, a kind of geospatial application or dashboard is one that my current organization um, built. Um, this is the COVID Atlas. If you haven't checked it out, the URL is at the bottom of the screen here, um, uscovidatlas.org, uh, the uscovidatlas.org. And this is, um, a data, again, a dashboard that fills in the, the county level data for COVID um, cases and COVID deaths and vaccinations. All the information that we can really find and suck together in one place applies a bunch of spatial statistics to it and then shows you kind of clusters of, of um, recoveries of cases of deaths etc around the country and again this started off as a, an R shiny dashboard if people have ever used R shiny but then it got more and more complicated needed more and more data and um, Dylan who's my colleague eventually was brought onto the project kind of build it out from scratch using a whole bunch of different technologies and this is good but it suffers from the same problem it's kind of something that requires um, a developer to go in and change little things. And like, it's not quite as bad as the Hester Street thing I built, but there's a lot of work just maintaining the text, like just maintaining the, the colors and all that good stuff. Um, so it becomes really, really hard to do. Ah, no noise. Um, there we go. Um, and so really kind of like, when we think about what's involved in building one of these, you can think about how many different like roles there are in building a dashboard like this, right? Or an application like this. 
we have stakeholder engagement. So we need to like work with stakeholders, the people who are actually going to use the tool, um, to figure out what their, their problem statements are or research statements. Um, they've got to give, we work with them to figure out what key insights to include in the dashboard, what ones not to include, use cases, um, and building a user base. All that good stuff is like one role. The data role is another role when building something like this. Um, it's rare that you find a data set that's just clean and usable online. And as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, it usually takes a lot of work to take something you've found, even from a really good source like the New York Times, for example, where a lot of this COVID data comes from, and like basically make sure that it's clean, make sure that it's unbiased now where internet users are very, um, you know, they're very savvy and they expect like a really high quality experience from anything they interact with online. And that's a whole lot of stuff, right? That's the, the, we think I'm just going to put some data on a map and then you start thinking about all this stuff and you realize just how many people are involved or how many roles are involved. Um, and even that last part, just building out the interaction bit of this, um, if you've ever tried to do this, there's a whole like universe of tools out there that, you know, like you can um, like <laughs> bring to bear in this. And it's even just like a, a struggle to figure out which ones you should be using. Should I be using Mapbox, MapLibre? Should I be using Leaflet for the maps? Should I be using WebGL? Should I be using non-WebGL? Should I be using React as a front-end framework? All this stuff. And so like if you're doing this for the first time or you're doing this like after a long time and not like um, making stuff, then the, the, just the landscape of tools can be really bewildering and really kind of hard to like nail down what you want to use. And so at the end of this, you need a huge team of people um, and you need to coordinate them all. And that's just to get something basic online. And so really what we're trying to think about at the Center for Visual Data Science is how can we simplify this? How can we build out tools that mean that you don't have to be a developer to go in and change the help text on the website? How do we um, you know, make it so that you can take a data set from the New York Times and put it through like a very simple cleaning process so that your data is a little bit cleaner than it was when you started? How can we take a data set that has, say, for example, county IDs from the census but doesn't have any geospatial information and join that really easily with the geospatial data set? And how, how can we just like take all these hurdles that like you, if you don't know this space very well, you're going to have run into. And even as somebody who's been in this space for a long time, I often like get tripped up by these things um, and or like just spend a lot of time doing this like, basic boring stuff. Um, how can we make it all that easier and how can we can make it a bit smoother? And so our solution to that is a tool that we're calling Matico or Matico. We're not entirely sure how to pronounce it yet. Um, <laughs> we made the word up um, out of just like a bunch of letters that we liked, more or less. There's no meaning behind it. Really, it's just like a bunch of letters we liked. But then half the team started calling it Matico, and the other half the team started calling it Matico, and now we can't agree on which one it is. So I'll use them interchangeably throughout the talk. But Matico or Matico is the, the name of the platform. And really what it is is a series of like little components that can be used together or used apart, basically. And they all, they all work really seamlessly together, but they're designed to kind of be modular in such a way that you can take the part that you want and just use it. So for example, GeoJ is a tool that we have that does that um, joining of like uh, polymer data, just like a CSV or like an Excel file to geospatial boundaries. So you upload your data to a website. Actually, you don't even upload it. You just drag it onto your browser. It stays on your computer. It checks the columns, tries to guess what kind of geographic boundary there is. And then it goes away and downloads those boundaries from the census and allows you to download the file as a geojSON file. So you can really easily enrich your data with geospatial information using um, GeoJ. And then we have things, what, the ones that we'll be talking about most today are the Matico Editor, which is their, our tool for building applications, um, spatial applications, um, just using drag and drop and clicking and clicking about rather than writing code. And a server, which is for storing data, for editing data, and for allowing community management data. So that's a huge other part of this. Like, how do you get multiple stakeholders all accessing the different data sets that you're using for your application? And these two things can be used together. They work really well together, but they can also use, be used separately. So Matico Editor, which you're going to see today, can run completely separately from anything else. And it runs without any server whatsoever. It's just, it's just a simple, if you, if you build web applications, it's a single page website. For everybody else, that just means that it's just a, a page that runs on your computer. It doesn't really talk to the internet very much, um, but it allows us to create really interesting things and then share those things very easily. And that means it's really cheap to maintain. There's like literally nothing. The dashboards we're gonna build today, there's gonna be like literally no hosting costs and hosting, which is also kind nice. So that's the idea. Um, the communities we're trying to serve with this are mainly researchers, um, uh, people who work in nonprofits, NGOs, basically anybody who's not trying to make a buck, but trying to do something interesting in the world. Um, and because of that, we're trying to build it in such a way that it's, it's very free to run. It's either free to run or very cheap to run. It's accessible. We're licensing it in a way that you can never really make it like um, charged for to some extent. It's always going to be open and free. And we want to build it out as a community. So we want to have a very low barrier to entry, but a high ceiling for complexity in the things that you build. We want to get rid of the technical abstractions so we can get the boring stuff out of the way. We want to 
center accessibility and collaboration. So all the tools we're building this out of are all kind of accessible from the start. They're all kind of um, good with screen readers and good with accessibility options. We're using color safe um, color palettes, that kind of thing. And then we want it to be extensible and flexible. So if, if it doesn't do something you want it to do, it's easy for you to kind of extend it and do more things with it. And so that's kind of our ethos around what we're, we're trying to build on the today. As I see, this is all very early. Um, so we're putting it in front of you guys to kind of hear what you think, to inspire some use cases, to see kind of what you might actually want to do with this um, and how we can sort of direct it towards that, that flow. We're about to go through a, a kind of big push to get this to the point whereby we have kind of like our alpha release so that everybody can play with it without it breaking every five seconds. But then after that, our, our, um, our, sort of, you know, our focus is going to be on community management of the tool. Um, how do we create a community of people who are helping us steward what gets built in the tool and how it's used and how it's, it's accessible. So if you like what you see today and you want to be part of that community group or you just want to tell me about why it sucks or like what it could do better, feel free to come up and talk to me and I'll also put up some contact details on the slide as well. So before we dive into the um, demo, does anybody have any questions about any of that? This is a kind of, for me, a feeling in the room, who here would describe themselves as like a developer or like data scientist or analyst? Okay, <laughs> um, who here would they, like be more in the kind of community organization or kind of like organization or like organization in general? A few people? Okay, and I'm sure for a lot of people, those two things are overlapping, right? They're kind of like both in the same, the same boat. So yeah, okay, great. So if you want to follow along with this, you can. Um, if you want to go to um, app.mexico.app, which is our, 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 our basically our development server, you should be able to sign up for an account there. Um, again, this is a, a demo server, so don't expect anything that lives there to kind of be long lasting. We're going to be kind of like typing it quite a lot. Um, but just for today, you can use it to kind of go ahead and have a play with the tools that we're building. Um, well, that went off the screen. Let me just bring it back on here. Um, so if you do that, um, I'm sorry, my, my actually, I, I've been struggling to get my screens to in there, so I'm going to have to look at the projector here while I talk, which is a bit of a pain. Um, but there we go. So you go to the website here, app.medical.app, and you should be able to sign up. And then when you do that, if you come through to apps, and then say, create new app, the screen is very, there it is, okay. Um, and you'll be able to create a new app, so just give it a name, my awesome thing. Are you, are you on the web version? The web version? It's like a, a one page. This is, you know, I'll, let me save my questions for later. Okay, so no worries. Um, so do this, public, firm, and then click through, and you'll get to the app building um, site, basically. So we're going to start there. So if you want to follow along, do that. If you don't want to follow along, don't worry about it. It's all good. Um, we're going to be using, I'm going to be using a local version of this, um, which is just because it will save on a little bit of bandwidth, and it will make it so that we can um, have a little bit more screen real estate. But it's basically the same thing. And this is what I mean by when I say that this thing can run kind of independently of the server. So this is just running on my computer as a static website, just hang it out there. So this is kind of the, the application. Um, uh, you can see here on the left, we have a kind of navigation bar. And then on the right, we have our, our editor. So this is where we're gonna like edit the application itself. So Medical allows us to have multiple different pages. So I'm just gonna click this plus button and we've added a page. So this is our home page. It's just the page we're gonna start on. Um, if I click on this little gear icon here, then I see the details of the page on the right hand side. This is basically the editing pane now. And I can do things like I can change its name. So if I really want it to be home, I could say, you know, like landing. Um, it changes and updates the application in real time. So for page management, for like kind of laying out your application, that's very quick. Is that a second page here? And then we'll go call this one info and we'll give it a path. So this is going to be the URL that you go to that page from. And I'm going to change this to an info icon. And again, this is all happening in real time. So there we've got two pages. This is page zero. We go to the landing page, this is page one. And you see that the URL changes. So we can basically create a URL structure for your application, just each page that you want to have on there. That's great. Our info page is going to contain info about what we're going to do today. And we're going to make a map about squirrels. So I'm just going to say, are oh, awesome. Apologies for my spelling and typing. <laughs> and then because we're doing markdown, I can just grab this image URL, um, copy an image address, uh, come back to the editor. And I'm going to put this in as a little markdown image. And there we go, a little banjo squirrel. So, not very interesting, not very exciting, right? But this is kind of like solving that problem we saw before, where if somebody needs to update the text now on the info page, they just come in here and type it into this box, and it's good to go. Um, so this is kind of like maybe like your dissertation page, or like kind of talking about how everything works. So this is kind of like laying out. Let's do something more interesting. So we'll go back to our landing page. We'll click on the edit button. We'll get it into edit mode. We'll remove the text here, and then what we'll do is we'll um, add a section in here. So. Pages can have multiple sections. Um, we're, we're planning on having different ways of laying out sections. So it could be like a long scrolling page where those different sections come up when you scroll at different parts of it. 
Um, in this case, the sections are tabs. Um, and so if we don't have any, we don't see the tabs, but this is just the, the tabs basically here. Um, and if I click onto the section, um, you see that I can name it, I can change the layout, and then I've got this like pane section here. So within a section, there's this idea of panes, which is anything you can display on the, on the page, right? And so let's add in something fun. Let's add in a map. So we're gonna click on add pane, call it map one, because I'm imaginative that way. Click on the button, and then we get a map on the page. So this is now a, a sort of map just hanging out on our page. If we click on the button here, we will be able to like um, edit the map. So let's make it full screen. I'm just clicking on this button here. We can also change that up. So if we wanted to make it smaller, we just change the values here. We're working on making this all kind of drag and drop and like, um, you know, like, like sizable with your mouse. But right now we just got a couple of buttons. So I can make it left, make it right. Um, I can come back to the section here and I can add another map, which we'll use in a minute. Let's go on map two. And then I'll just move this one off to the right. So now we've got two maps. They're interactive. I can move around. Um, I can change the orientation like this. Um, and I can set the view of these. So if I if I want um, the map to start here when I load at the page, I can just say set from current view, and it fills out the latitude, longitude, zoom, and bearing, and everything like that as well. So that's kind of where the, where the map's going to start off in the view. These are a little bit hard to tell apart just now. So let's go ahead and change the base map on this one. Um, the layers go into dark mode. Get a nice dark map. Nice and moody. Um, this one will make something a little lighter, a bit simpler. And then we've got our our maps here, um, which is great. So now we need to put some data on the maps. And where are we gonna get data from? Well, this is the school of data. So we're gonna get data from the open data portal. Um, so we can pull data in from anywhere around the internet. And um, we can build it, currently pull in GeoJSONs or CSVs. Um, and we can just basically provide a URL um, and it'll pull the data in from wherever you wanna get. So we go to data sets now, we go to add, we get a little pop-up. And so we've got either CSV data set, GeoJSON data set. Ignore this one just now. This is something for people who work with raster data. Um, and we've got the Socrative data sets as well. So if you had, say, for example, uh, like CSV file somewhere on GitHub, it's accessible by the internet, you can just put in the URL, give it a name, tell us what the latitude and longitude column on that CSV is, hit go, and then that data set will be loaded into the, the platform to use. Um, we're gonna use the open data portal. So we're gonna come through here, and we set it up so that it's gonna like ask you which open data portal you wanna use. Um, obviously, we're gonna use New York's one. Um, so if you see it, yell me. There you go, data from the city of New York, US. It's going to go away and it's going to load in all, like a list of all the data sets that are provided by the open data portal. And then we can basically just search for the data set we want. So I said, we're going to use the Sparl data set, um, since it's part of Sparl data. And then as you load this up, so you see a little blurb about what the data set is. You can say view this in portal to look at it on the open data portal, um, get an idea of what the data looks like. And then we can look through here and try and find a column for the live shit and a column for the long -term. Um, if, if the data is available on the open data portal just as a spatial data set, you can just pull it in immediately. But because this one is just like a tabular data set, we need to tell it which ones to use. So for latitude, we're going to set it to be Y. And for longitude, we're going to set it to be X, which is what the, the, the coordinates are in the open data. Click on the data set, and then we've got our data set loaded in. So now we've got an access to the open data portal data set for squirrels. So let's add it to our map. Just click here, the components, and then we add a layer and call it furry. Um, and we select it from the data sets we've loaded there. So when I do this, we see all the squirrels on the map. So this is now coming straight from the data, open data portal, being pulled into the system and being displayed on the map so you can interact. Um, it doesn't look that great right now, so let's, um, let's uh, make it look a little bit nicer. So we come through to the layers, I can edit the layer, I can do things like change the line width, um, so make that a little bit smaller, and then we can change the radius of the points, make them a little bit nicer as well. And you see kind of everything gets updates in real time, so you get a feel for what the map looks like. Um, so it's very easy to kind of like just use this to kind of eyeball what's going on. We can even change the fill color, it's fun. Or we can do something else, which is we can make, we can use a kind of style by value um, mode. So if we want, for example, um, to style using X, the X coordinate, we can do that. And um, it goes away, shows us a little histogram of the bins, allows us to change different palettes. So we can maybe say this one here, um, and again, everything's updating in real time, so you kind of know what it looks like. Um, and we can kind of change up anything we want in here to be kind of driven by data. So any value in the data set can be used to style the points, to color them, to size. I'm actually going to make this um, map dark, just because it makes it look a little bit nicer. Dark. Yeah, it's a bit nicer. And we'll actually just go in and make this points a little bit better. So we've got our squirrel data set now. So we're seeing there's nice styling on there, some points. 
Um, we can, you know, zoom in and out. Um, let's add a second data set in for this map. And um, we'll just use the, the borough boundaries data set because it's easy to find and easy to get. So I'll come to my data sets again, add a new one in. Um, again, go to the open data portal for New York. And this time we'll look at um, boroughs, borough boundaries. So this is a nice simple one. And this one is already a GeoJSON file, so we can just pull it directly in. So we just click load data set, takes a second or two, pulls the data in, and then that's ready for us to use. So let's add it to our map on the right here. Let's add a layer, boroughs, add. We should get some nice borough islands. Um, again, like you probably want to do something different with this. This is like a dumb data set to use because everybody knows what boroughs look like, but it's just like an example of how to pull in a polygon data set. And um, we can edit this, as I said before, and just make the fill color data driven, make it nice pastel colors. If you maybe won't like one of the colors, we can just come in here and change it. So <laughs> Manhattan, you can make it into like a light nicer color or a like lighter color. And then that says good to go there. So you can imagine that this data set was something like census data or something like that. You may be looking at a census variable and you may want to look at that in relationship to the squirrels. So like you may want to have it so that the maps are synced up. We can do that dead easy here as well. So if we go to the controls and we just say, we want to sync this map view now um, from another map. We see map one in here, press this button. And now when I move around map one, map two moves around with it. So it's like nice because we can then sync together different parts of the application um, dead easily. So again, there's no coding just now. And if I had to write this as code, It'd probably take me a good couple of hours just to get to this point of having everything on the page synced up, colored in all these good ways. So it's, it's kind of just trying to shorten the route to doing so That's our mapping tools. Um, any questions on those? Yeah. Uh, that was kind of fast. I'm just wondering what I missed. Um, when you synced up the two maps, what happened? So basically, um, before they were scrolling independently, and now the two maps are scrolling oh, okay. together. So they basically just sync up the the um, the. Their, their data together. They're looking oh, okay. yeah, yeah, just like same size. Same size, the same zoom, same location. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that comes to mind. So you're loading these data sets, and let's just say they're dynamic, right? Like, what if um what if they're so massive they like start making my computer really slow on a server? Is that something that this handles or yeah, so so we're we're trying to make it as, as proficient as possible for data sets that are big. Um we're we're trying to create a, a kind of a new file format for making them really small and we're gonna build some tools to convert other data sets to that file format. But just pulling in something from the open data portal that's hundred megabytes, two hundred megabytes is gonna be slow regardless of what you do, right? That's when the server comes into play. So this is all not using the server. This is all just using the static um, website. There's no like computer in the cloud that's running this at this point. It's just like a static website. And so it's all happening on my computer locally in the browser. Um, if you want to bring in bigger data sets, we recommend loading them into the server. And I'll show that a little so bit towards the end. So that's a recommended path. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, one of the most popular data sets is the uh, 2010 to present drone one. Drone one data yeah, because it's huge, right? Yeah. Yeah, about 15 or 16 gigabytes? Yeah. Is that something that this could handle? Not directly. Again, you'd probably need to load it into the server and then have it run from there. And um, we haven't stress tested the data set that large in the server yet, but we can definitely play around with it. Um, we're trying to think, so normally when you can, when a server communicates to a friend like this, it's sending over either vector files, which you can definitely do, um, or it's sending over kind of like uh, data in a, a screen format. That amount of data is still pretty large, so you'd probably need to be able to just look, be looking at a, a subset of it at any given time. But we have a system in this so that if you want to, you can define like a, a range of time or a range of space or a range of like variables, and it will just request those parts of the data set from the server. So that's that's kind of like the newer parts of what we're building out, and I'll show some details of that um, as we go through. But yeah, potentially you could pull that in. The other thing we're doing with the server, and again, I'll show this towards the end, is we have an incremental ETL system in it. So basically you can set up a URL, so the, the open data portal URL, for example, a little SQL script to clean it and do anything you want with it. So maybe like drop some columns, rename some columns, clean up any of the data that's in there. And it will only grab the amount of data that you tell it to. So you can set it up so that every day it just grabs the new 311 data, puts it through this cleaning script, loads it into the table with everything else, and keeps it up to date. So the server, even though it's not linked to the live source, can be set up to basically do that kind of incremental uh, ETL. Yeah. Um, how many layers can we add on the same, same map? Oh, as many as you want. So if you want to, we can add, well, there, there's definitely a limit, but it's in the thousands. Like, I guess yeah. move the, the squirrel population into it. Yep, so we can just do, we can't do we can move it in, but let's do this. Uh, squirrels, add, and then we'll need to rearrange the layers, so it pops on top, there you go. You also, can uh, we make it as a dynamic in terms of if we were to see, let's say, last five years squirrel population? Yeah, so we can Sorry, do that. We don't, we don't have that built out for dates yet, um, but we have it for, um, for for other variables. So let me just show that actually. So there's two ways of doing that. One way you can do is 
we can come back through to our pins um, uh, in here in our section. And we can add in either a control pane, um, which will give us the ability to add in sliders and um, like drop downs. But actually, more interesting than that is let's add in a histogram pane. So we add in the histogram pane here. We select the data set. So we take the squirrel census data set. And then let's take one of the variables in here. So uh, let's see above ground cider measurement. By the way, if MD here is from the squirrel census and can tell me what this value actually is, I'd love to know what it is. It's just the one I've been using for demos, but I don't really know what the, that actually means. But if we do this, we can see we can create a histogram of the data um, really easily. We can move this around. So let's just move it to like, I don't know, like 5% like numbers of the screen, like halfway up it. I don't know. This is going to be beautiful because we're doing this kind of live, right? But you can see kind of you can put that whatever you want. Um, we can change the number of bins that the histogram has. We can change the color like we would have before. And we can even style it in color using another variable if you wanted to. You won't do that just yet. But what I can do is I can come in here and I can create a little um, like slider here to sort of um, uh, like, like basically like select the data we want to show in the map. Now, because we got it in two maps, we need to tell it which one to use, basically. So if we come through to our first map, and we go to our uh, squirrel data set, our squirrel layer. And um, then what we can do is if we look in here at the data source, we can add filters to that data source. So if I add a range filter, I can put it on that same variable. So above ground uh, cider. And I can either put in like a manual range. So if I say 10 here, for example, then hopefully you'll see some of the points disappear. So you can filter it just by the manual range. Or what we can do is we can click on these little buttons and say, I want to select this variable from the range query here. I'm going to say the min, and say the max. And then what will happen is if I drag this, then we get the, the data filtering as we go through there. So you can get like high like interactivity between the components here. Um, like everything can be tied together really easily. Um, for example, we can just like um, make this like interact here. We can also put on like say a scatter plot and have the scatter plot updated by the same filters. So as you filter that region, the scatter plot changes the data that's on there. So there's there's a way to just basically specify filters for any variable you want, and then data that pulls from that for the map or the pane can apply those filters and be used to like create some interactivity in the map, which is kind of fun. We can do hover overs um, and a whole bunch of other like interesting stuff there as well. But just in this, this of the sake of time, let's just like round this up by adding in uh, like one more thing. So if we come back to our section here, let's move this uh, histogram pane down to the bottom, just inside the way. Oh, that's the X, that's the Y. So put it in here. Um, so the way. We can actually do give it a title as well. So some data point. We can give it like an X label and a Y label. It's like maybe it's nonsense right now. But again, this is like trying to be, make it so that it doesn't require me as a developer to go and change things. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll add one last thing to get this off, which is going to be our little um, a little heading. So we come in here to our section again, um, add a new pane, this same text. Oh, Sorry, my names are getting worse as this goes on. Um, but we can also just put in like a little text pane here, which could be our header. I don't know, call it something like query boys. Um, and we're gonna have like I have like a whole bunch of like formatting and things in here as well. Make this a bit smaller, put it at the top here. Uh, yeah, and as I say, we're we're planning on making it so you can just drag these things around so you don't have to like hold this button down for, for ages. Um, but we're not quite there yet. This is the, OK, cool. So imagine that's your heading at the top there. And that's kind of that your introduction text is in there as well. It's telling you about all the things about this project. And so that's kind of as done. Um, now that we're done, we just publish it by going to say edit equals false. On the server, you just get a link. But because I'm doing this in the, the sort of local tool, you can see that. When I do that, the editor goes away. The data all loads up. And then this is available to use as a dashboard on the web. So you can publish this now. People can go in and use this and play around with it and access the data and like do whatever you want with it. This can be hosted out of a static website bin or GitHub pages or anywhere else. The server will automatically host it for you, but you can also just like download the source from this and place it, put it wherever you want. Essentially what's happening here is as we've done all this stuff um, behind the scenes, um, what's been happening is it's been running this big long specification for how the application should work. So all the details about the, the way that the data sets are linked together, the way the maps are linked together, what colors to use, is all part of the specification that the library then knows how to read and build the dashboard out of it. And so this, this thing here, copying and pasting this, is all I need to do to recreate everything that we just did there. And that's how we basically host this live. All right, we're about 10 minutes away from the end. So does that make sense, Tiffany? Is there any other questions about like what this can do?
Okay, very, very quickly, I want to show you the server side um, integration, just to answer the questions that we saw before there. So this is the same thing we saw before. It's just a little bar on the side, um, but you can do everything I just showed you before. Um, I might have some other applications in here that I've built. So let's see. Uh, this is a data, oh, that one doesn't work. Of course it doesn't. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, so let's do, let's see if I see another one. Um, maybe this one? Maybe this is data? All right, apparently I didn't make any data myself. <laughs> Normally I do this on my own um, uh, machine. But yeah, so on the server side of things, we can upload data sets. So basically if you want to in here, we can create a new data set. Um, we can upload it from a file on our computer. So for example, here, I can upload a data set, um, I don't know, US County Facts. This is one that we'll be using with the, the, the um, uh, COVID data sets. I open that up, I get a little preview of what's in there. I can give it a name, uh, COVID data, or something similar, a little description, and then I can just, down here, I'll upload, and I'll upload it to the server. So this is now just like putting it up to the server, um, uh, and then it appears in my data sets here. So COVID data, I click through to that, I get, you can see it on the map, I can see the data in the table, and this is now stored on our, our database and our server essentially. So if you needed to upload your own data, or if you wanted to bring data in from another source and tidy it up, you can do it here. So this is kind of the data management side of things. And this is nice because I can, you can either, um, do this quickly. Um, I can either refresh this. Um, I can either uh, you know play around with this using SQL. If you know SQL, you can sort of um, filter it and play around, get a feel for your data. Um, we can either do that, or we can um, just zoom out, or we can take one of the variables at the top here and color the map by it. So this is the number of um, hospital beds available in each county. Um, so we can very quickly visualize it. Um, we can also click on our feature editor. And so let's say we knew that one of the data points was wrong. Let's say that actually the number of beds has gone up. Anybody can come in and just update that, hit save changes, and then that updates the database. So again, this is something that you don't have to do as a developer. Anybody on your team who understands the data can go in, find the thing they're interested in, and change it. Not only that, but they can also edit the geometries. So if we think this county is wrong for some reason, we can do some gerrymandering or whatever. <laughs> um, and then we just save it. And again, the data set's then saved back to our server, so that's available then. So again, it's, it's giving access to people to edit and maintain the data set who are not necessarily technical. Um, this can then be used as a data set in the front end builder, or you can basically access the data directly um, through queries. We also have something called the API builder. Um, this is an interesting one here. What this allows us to do is it allows us to write a little um, a chunk of SQL. So again, like this is where a little bit of code comes into this. We're hoping to build out interfaces to make this so that you can actually generate the SQL just by clicking and dragging and using buttons, etc. But for now, we just write it itself. This is taking a data set I uploaded of Bigfoot sightings in the US, um, which is actually a fairly large data set. And it's counting the number of Bigfoot sightings in every county in the US. Um, and it's doing that by day of the week. So um, basically what we can do in here is we can put a little placeholder, this thing day, um, dollar sign day, and then that can be an input variable. So that essentially what we're doing here is creating an API, where if I say change the day value, it needs to be an integer, um, it will change the data on the map. So this is now combining two data sets that I uploaded dynamically with some input variables to change the data that's being presented. And you get that either as a data endpoint or a tail endpoint. So you get the tail set or the data set. And this is a bit more technical, but this, this allows that to then be pulled into the front end server and used there. And so what we're working on just now is allowing you to have controls that would replace parts of this SQL query, change the resulting data set, and then visualize that in the front end. So you've got like a lot of flexibility in how you actually then construct your applications and structure your interactivity, which is kind of fun. Um, we have an admin panel, which is just some pretty colors right now, because um, I did all that by my hand, but we're eventually we're gonna have this so that you can install this in a server. You as the owner of the server can create user accounts for people. Um, different people can have access to different data sets. Um, you can either have access to read them, update them, or use them in dashboards. Anybody can create their own app, can create their own data set, can create their own dashboard with specific permissions. And so then you can have like say a community of people all working on the same data set, maintaining it, keeping it live, so that the Hester Street thing didn't happen, doesn't happen again. So that nobody has to call me to change the name of an organization or the name of a, a you know a piece of text on the page. And that's basically the idea. Um, so the server would be where you put um, larger code bases. As I said before, we have the, I've lost my mouse now, there we go. We have the ability to pull in things um, on a schedule. So if we come through here to a new data set, we put in a URL, give it a name and a description. Um, we can do an update frequency here. 
Oh, and I'm missing a thing. Okay, I don't know why this isn't updated, but there's a little um, tab here usually as well that allows us to create an ETL script. So just hit that, write a piece of SQL, and I'll get run on the data set as the brought into you know, Web, essentially. So that's how we can sync up data sets. So that's Matico. And so we're going to be working on this a lot over the summer. Um, basically, we're going to be really polishing what we have to make sure that it works really well in a lot of different circumstances. We need people to test it, though, because things. what I've learned is when I test things, I just do the same things over and over again, and then somebody else will come along and break it in a new and interesting way I didn't even think about before. So we'd love people to try this out. We'd love to hear use cases you have for this, things that you could do with it, like, like groups that you would work with who might find this useful, and dashboards you might want to build, and features you might want to see in the platform as well. So if you're interested in doing all that, or getting involved in any way whatsoever, um, you can check out our website. Um, uh, Matical.app is the website. App.matical.app is the builder we saw before. Matical.app is just the website. Um, if you want to contribute to the code, if you're a coder and want to actually get involved in this and actually um, contribute like pull requests or whatever, or issues, our GitHub is uh, Matical platform. Um, and then we're on Twitter as Matical app, but I haven't even tweeted from that like user account yet, so it's just a blank user account. So head us up on there and I may actually play with their tweeting. Um, but we'd love to involve this community. We'd love to get people involved in this uh, community ownership of this thing and kind of like help us make it something really powerful that can persist for a really long time and has a lot of value to life. So I'll end up there, ask if there's any questions. If not, feel free to come in and talk to me at the end. I know it's the end of the day, we're all tired. There's like another closing keynote, so I won't be offended if you guys like are just done. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Does this seem like it could be useful? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the question is, do we have an audit log, essentially, of the edits to a given data set? Not currently, but this is a request that we've been asked for a number of times now, so we're going to start looking into how to do that. Um, where it might be troubling, or like hard, is um, if there's a lot, if, you, if you're doing large numbers of edits. So we, at some point in the future, we're going to add the ability to click on a given column there and see things like replace everything in this column with this value to this value. And we can record that transaction to some extent, but if we want to record all the data changes, it becomes pretty large pretty quickly if you're doing that. So we want to figure out ways to do that in a, in a concerted fashion, but it's a feature we definitely want to do. And I'd love to talk about what requirements that would actually have, like what would you need to record, what would you want to record, um, all that good stuff. Yeah. So I comment on that. I've worked on a data platform that has a similar like audit log. Nice. And um, it is an unsolved problem in the industry, yeah. in my opinion. So any solution, that you come up with is going to be pretty interesting. Yeah. This is new territory. There isn't a way to do it easily yet. I think it'll be kind of the platform is meant to be flexible. So, for example, if you wanted to update a data set using an SQL statement, you could just do that and run it. That's kind of tricky then because it's really hard to capture what that update is doing in a, in a concise way. So, it may be that we can do audit logs for like manual changes or changes using the interface, but for other things, it may just not be capturable. So, I don't know. We'll, 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 figure, we'll figure something out or we'll throw up our hands and see it. It's not possible, <laughs> or it's possible, but you have to have like a huge hard disk, which just changed like controls every single thing. Our time's up, the bell's going. Um, sorry, we didn't leave too much time for questions, but if you're interested in this, you want to play around with it more, come and uh, grab me. We have an email sign up on the website, so if you want to keep in kept in touch about what we're doing, all the new updates, sign up for the email on there. We promise we won't spam you. We haven't sent out one email yet, so we won't do many. Um, but it's been great talking to you all, and have a great rest of your day.